So, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today and the webinar of Marburg Virus Disease Updates. And that will be presented uh, by me, I'm Ahlam Al Amri, and my other uh, respectful colleagues, Dr. Nadim Burhan, and Mr. Adel Anizi, and Mr. Yahya Nashba from the General Directorate of Infection Prevention and Control of Healthcare Facilities at Ministry of Health. And we hope that you will gain uh, valuable and significant information about this particular topic. And finally, at the end, we will open the channel of communication between uh, you and us uh, to answer all obtained questions and inquiries uh, from you, and we will respond to them accordingly. So let's start together. So inshallah, our outlines uh, or domains for today webinar will be as the follow. Uh, first of all, an overview of the full background and picture of uh, Marburg virus disease and its current status, and it will be presented by me. And then the clinical presentation and manifestation and the needed management and medical intervention of Marburg virus disease. And this uh, session, it will be uh, presented by Dr. Nadim Burhan. After that, uh, the main required infection prevention and control measures, uh, precaution, that must be implemented uh, to the Marburg virus disease cases in order to break down the chain of infection, and it will be introduced by Mr. Adel Renzi. And finally, the last uh, outline or, or session or topic for uh, today, inshallah, webinar will be the current global glance and the international and national outbreak response to this outbreak, and will be presented by my colleague Yahya Nashba. So, as we all know, these uh, days uh, and currently, various international and national uh, reports have been posted in regard of Marburg virus disease and its related impact on different nations. However, as we as we are healthcare workers, and uh, this is not new for us, and we need to update our knowledge and improve our skills and abilities in regard of any infectious threat that may impose a risk uh, to our healthcare facilities and may uh, uh, and uh, request for us to uh, manage the situation. So, uh, first of all, we need from you and request from you that do not be panic. And said we have to uh, pay to your enemy. We need to know about our enemy. So let's explore together. So what is the Marburg virus and how dangerous is it? And what we need to know about the Marburg virus? Actually, Marburg virus uh, disease is a rare but a severe hemorrhagic fever, which affects both people and non-human primates. Marburg virus disease is caused by Marburg virus and a genetically unique a zoonotic or a animal pawn of a, a phylovirus family. And uh, during the last years or the last um, a few years, uh, we experiencing um, an emerging of infectious disease that related to the zoonotic uh, or uh, zoonotic viruses, and which is around 60% globally. So from where the name is derived, actually Marburg virus is a member of them phylovridae family, which consists of a genera of Marburg virus, Ebola virus, and etc. So the phylovridae actually uh, is, is derived from the Latin uh, prefix, which is called philium, which is, is to mean that thread appearance, and referring to the morphology of the phyloviruses particle as in the picture here, it's shown in this slide. So viruses in the family of uh, phylovridae can cause severe hemorrhagic fever in people and non-human uh, primates, such as monkeys and gorillas and may spread in other animals such as bats. Filoviruses are enveloped in lipid fatty membrane and appear in several shapes and mainly in a thread, uh, as we mentioned earlier. So uh, filoviruses are zoonotic, that means transmitted from um, animals to people, and there's a wire host of Marburg viruses, it's, it's an African throat uh, bat, but further study needed here to determine if we have another species may also serve as a host for this virus. So we can also access through this link of the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses to find out more classification and more further information regarding this uh, specific viruses. So actually the filobridae, it's, it consists of two um, subtypes, uh, Marburg and Ebola. And in this, uh, inshallah, webinar we'll focusing on, on, about the Marburg. So we have two different strains the Marburg virus and Raven, and both of them, or both strain or variants have the similar, similar clinical manifestation and presentation. So member of the family of Philoridae produce a variously shaped linear and non-segmented negative sense RNA genomes. And the family currently includes five genera, genera as we mentioned earlier. So what's the meaning of the negative sense um, RNA genomes? That's mean for this particular viruses, 
with the negative stranded RNA are produced by both process of transcription and translation in order uh, to have mRNA. And this is, it will be used to instruct the host cell to make viruses component. So let's now to explore further history and background of the Marburg viruses. Um, in 1967, the Marburg virus was the first uh, uh, filovirus discovered following the outbreaks in Germany and Yugoslavia, which is now called Serbia, and it's uh, uh, concluded or lead to seven deaths. And, uh, and particularly, it was the outbreak among the laboratory working, uh, workers working with the tissues of an African green monkeys imported from Uganda, as well as among medical personnel who are providing the care for those infected cases. After that, in 1998 uh, and 2000, the first large outbreak that because of this particular Marburg virus uh, as a Marburg virus disease, and it was in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it led to 128 uh, deaths, and the case fatality was at around 83%. And the most cases occurred in the young male work, um, workers at the gold main. As we mentioned earlier, it's the host reservoir for this case is the fruit bats, and these uh, mainly it's available or it will be um, uh, presented in the caves and uh, in the gold mine. After that, in 2004, 2005, it was reported as the largest outbreak in the history to date. And particularly in Yugo Provenance in Angola, resulted in 329 deaths, and the face and the case fatality rate it was 90 percent. And, uh, and it's reported in the evidence that it was an outbreak in the pediatric award also noted um, in that period of time, and it uh, was because of the contaminated equipment of the uh, uh, in the inside the healthcare facility. So we have, and this is give us a highlight that about the importance of them cleaning and disinfection in regard of this equipment to avoid or, or break down the chain of infection in the healthcare facilities. In 2012 and 2014, 2017, also it's reported in Uganda and the death cases, it ranges actually from one to four cases based on the CDC reports. So let's have a glance at the current situation. Actually, um, nowadays we are hearing that about the outbreak that occurred in the equatorial of a Guinea outbreak, and we need update about it. So in February 13 and, and 2023, 20, uh, government officials in the equatorial Guinea declared a Marburg outbreak, and the deaths there, it was um, uh, it were about nine uh, deaths. So it was the first Marburg virus disease outbreak in that country. After that, in Tanzania, and particularly on March 21st, 2023, Tanzanian uh, government officials declared the country first ever outbreak of Marburg and its lead to five deaths. And inshallah, um, my colleague Yahya will explore further information regarding this outbreak. So from this link, you can access to the Marburg disease distribution map and you can find out from where the first initial um, outbreak happened in the history and till date. The reservoir host of the Marburg virus is a type of fruit bat native to Africa called the Egyptian, or it's called Rosettus aegyptiacus. Uh, so it's actually, it's, it's lead to the infection by the bat itself or the bat's bodily fluids. So bats infected with Marburg virus do not show any obvious signs of illness. And further study required here to determine if we have another species maybe uh, considered as a host to this virus. And if you see the picture here, you thought that this is a cute fuzzy um, a bit. Actually, it's, it's a, um, a massive beast that lead to the uh, various outbreak in the nations or in different uh, international uh, countries. So if we want to define the, the cases uh, as a clinical um, practitioners. So first of all, uh, we have to know that we have um, a definition or a clear criteria for suspected cases. We have to follow two um, uh, aspects, clinical criteria and epidemiological risk factors to identify the cases as suspected uh, cases. So NS is in a person who both have or consistent symptoms and risk factors or epidemiological risk factors uh, such as clinical criteria with a fever of greater than 38.6 uh, degrees centigrade and additional symptoms such as severe headache, muscle pain, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain or unexplained hemorrhage from different sides of the body. And here we have also epidemiological criteria 
to identify or define the case as suspected Marburg virus disease. So within a 21 days before the onset of symptoms, such as contact with the blood or other body fluid of a patient known to have um, to have or suspected to have Marburg residents or in trouble to an area where Marburg trans transmission is active or a direct handling of a dead or alive fruit bass, monkeys, chimpanzee, and etc. from the disease endemic areas. But the confirmed case, actually here we have a lab confirmed diagnostic evidence that lead or uh, uh, give us the diagnosis of a confirmed case of Marburg virus disease. So we have a different mode of transmission as we we uh, we earlier discussed in the previous slide that is the zoonotic virus. So it's unknown how Marburg virus first spread from its animal host to the people, but we have a primary transmission, and we are it's reported in the evidence that humans are mostly infected by handling dead <clears throat> or living infected animals, <clears throat> direct or indirect contact with bats. And most cases that reported uh, or recorded in those who spent a significant time in caves containing on paths. And also we have a mode of transmission as a secondary uh, mode of transmission by a direct contact with blood secretion organs or other body fluids of infected person or a direct contact with the surfaces and materials as we mentioned earlier uh, by using a contaminated uh, equipment or um, um, encountered with the contaminated surfaces. After this initial crossover of virus from the host animal to people, transmission occurs through person-to-person -person contact, and the virus spread through contact, such as through broken skin or mucous membranes in the eyes, nose, or mouth. So uh, now we'll go uh, through the manifestation and management of the uh, domain of the manifestation and management of the disease, and will be presented by Dr. Nadine. We'll come to Dr. Nadine. Thank you, Mrs. Ahlam, for your enlightening introduction about the uh, virus history, definition, and the nature of the disease. And welcome all. We, uh, we really appreciate that you took the time to be uh, here with us. Uh, in the second uh, heading, we are going uh, to focus on the disease manifestation and management um, of this webinar. Starting from the incubation period, which is defined as the period between the infection uh, uh, of the patient or individual by a pathogen, in our case here it's a virus, and the appearance of the disease sign and symptoms in uh, MVD or uh, Marburg virus disease, it's from 2 to 21 days. And it's very important to know that the incubation period uh, lasts up till uh, 21 uh, days uh, for uh, purpose of epidemiological uh, link risk factors and uh, isolation. And it's also uh, reported in the literature that the average incubation uh, period is typically between 5 to 10 days. Regarding the signs and symptoms of uh, the disease, Marburg virus disease manifestation changes throughout three uh, phases. First phase, uh, which is called uh, uh, general phase, and uh, described also as a ghost-like phase, because in this phase, the patient will uh, have a drawn feature, deep set eye, expressionless face, and extreme uh, lethargy, and it lasts from one to five days. Fever is subjective or uh, recorded, and it's usually more than 38 degrees. The patient will have or might uh, explain, uh, explore severe headache, severe malaise, uh, muscle ache and pain, chills, severe watery diarrhea, abdominal pain and cramps, nausea and vomiting, or an enthema, which is small spots of mucous membrane, usually appears with viral infections. And the second phase or early organ phase, and it lasts from six to 13 days after infection. And it's also described as a bleeding phase. Fever will also uh, sustain, and the patient might uh, 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 complain from uh, some sign and symptoms of upper or lower GI bleeding, like bloody diarrhea, melina, hematemesis, or other visceral uh, hemorrhage. A patient might experience petechiae or ecchymosis, other a mucosal uh, hemorrhage or uh, conjunctival uh, injection, uh, edema, and depression. And the third phase, or uh, last phase, which is called uh, latent 
phase, CNS manifestation will start to appear and it lasts from 14 to 20 days after infection. Also, the fever will sustain uh, and the patient might complain from dementia, confusion, coma, convulsion, metabolic disturbance, psychosis, or shock, beside diffuse coagulopathy or DIC, and uh, some liter literature reported orchitis. Regarding physical examination, full physical examination should be undertaken with aim of excluding a clear alternative diagnosis while looking for signs of viral hemorrhagic fever like conjunctival injection, purpuric rash, or other signs of bleeding. Note that Marburg virus disease is a multi-phase illness, first presenting with fever and non-specific symptoms, and later progressing to include febrile gastrointestinal symptoms. It is very important to note that not all patients will have signs or symptoms of bleeding or coagulopathy. Vital signs should be taken. A fever, it's very important because it could be, uh, uh, it is the persisting symptoms uh, in most patients. It's persist persistence is enough to raise the concern for infection in the appropriate epidemiological context. Wild variation in body temperature can be observed during a course of illness from normothermia or hypothermia occurring in the late uh, stage of a fatal infection, but the um, high fever, uh, more than 40 uh, degree is common. Blood pressure also could be affected. Hypotension is a feature of dehydration and shock and its presence in a later stage of disease. Pulse rate, blood bradycardia may be persist in the initial stage. However, tachycardia may be seen in the later shock, uh, uh, sorry, later stage of uh, infection or shock. Respiratory rate, tachypnea may be present in the later stage of illness, resulting from uh, metabolic acidosis due to uh, uh, huge uh, fluid loss. Healthcare worker may face a situation to examine a patient post-mortem. The coordinator or infection control staff should be consulted for any decision-making on post-mortem examination. Post-mortem examination of a hemorrhagic fever patient remains should be limited to essential evaluation only, and it should be performed by trained personnel. Personnel examining remains should wear a full set of PPE as it will be described in details further with uh, uh, Mr. Adil uh, al -Anizi. In addition, personal per, uh, performing autopsies of known suspected or suspected uh, hemorrhagic fever patients should wear a particulate uh, respirator or uh, uh, a NIOSH certified fit tested N95 or PAPR, uh, which we call it uh, power air uh, purifying respirator. When we are removing the PPE, Avoid any contact between soil gloves or equipment and the face or mucous membrane like eyes, nose, or mouth. Of course, hand hygiene should be performed immediately following the removal of PPE. Place specimen in clearly labeled non-glass leak-proof containers and deliver directly to designated specimen handling area. All external surfaces of specimen containers should be thoroughly disinfected using an effective and approved disinfectant prior to transportation. Tissue or body fluid for disposal should be carefully placed in a clearly marked sealed containers for further disposal or incineration. Managing exposure to a uh, virus through uh, exposure to body fluid, including blood, Persons, including healthcare workers, with percutaneous or needle stick or mucocutaneous exposure or after splash uh, exposure to blood or body fluid or secretions or excretions from a patient with suspected or confirmed hemorrhagic fever should immediately and safely stop any current task, leave the patient care area, and safely remove the PPE. Remove the PPE carefully according to the protocol. Immediately after leaving the patient care area, wash the affected skin surface or percutaneous uh, injury site with the soap and water. Accordingly, irrigate a mucous membrane uh, uh, infected or uh, affected site like uh, conjunctiva with a copious amount of water or eye wash solution and of course not uh, chlorine solution with other disinfectants. immediately report the incident to the local coordinator. This is a very uh, time-sensitive task. 
and should uh, be performed as soon as the healthcare worker leave the patient care unit. Exposed persons should be immediately evaluated, including for other potential exposure like HIV or hepatitis C virus, receive the follow-up care, including fever monitoring twice daily for 21 days after incident. Immediate consultation with an expert uh, in infectious disease is recommended for any exposed patient who developed fever within 20 days uh, of exposure. People suspected of being infected should be cared for or isolated, and the same recommendation outline until a negative diagnosis is confirmed. Contact tracing and follow up family, friends, co-workers, and other patients who may be, uh, have been exposed to virus through a close contact with the infected healthcare workers is essential. We need to diagnose the uh, uh, MVD disease uh, by a required test and investigation. Early detection and diagnosis of uh, MVD can be challenging as the early signs and symptoms of the disease is non-specific and difficult to distinguish from other infectious uh, disease such as malaria, typhoid fever, shigellosis, meningitis, and other viral hemorrhagic fever like Lassa or Ebola virus. The consequent delay in the diagnosis can therefore hinder survival chances and create challenges in controlling transmission and outbreak. Marburg virus is commonly suspected in those who have been exposed to geographic areas as discussed previously, where Marburg is common, particularly in individuals with a known exposure. During, during the early stage of MVD, detection of the virus can be made through a throat or nasal swab, cerebrospinal fluid sample or CSF, urine sample and or blood sample. Sample collected from individuals with MVD are a biological hazard and uh, should be handled and tested under maximum biological contaminant condition. Uh, these samples can be analyzed through enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or what we call it ELISA testing, reverse tra transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, or RT-PCR, and IgM capture ELISA to detect the antibodies, antigen, and protein specific to Marburg virus. Virus isolation may be also performed, but should only be done in a high contaminant laboratory with a good laboratory practice. Other inv investigations also important that could indicate uh, uh, the involvement of the disease. In renal function test, uh, we might uh, uh, see elevation in urea or uh, creatinine level that indicate renal injury, hypokalemia due to vomiting and uh, uh, diarrhea and hypocalcemia, uh, it's associated with a fatal infection. A blood lactate uh, uh, that could indicate a tissue hypoperfusion as an indication of shock. Also, assessment of blood gas very important, uh, uh, especially after uh, huge fluid loss and electro electrolyte disturbance. Coagulation study, maybe uh, we will uh, see elevation or prolongation in PT, PTT time. Uh, elevation also could happen in uh, liver enzyme and serum uh, amylase due to uh, uh, organ involvement or uh, pancreatitis. In blood culture, it's very important to rule out any other causes of uh, uh, bacterial uh, uh, sources of infection or shock. In CBC, typically with early stage of viral infection, we will see uh, uh, lymphocytopenia and uh, thrombocytopenia, but it also could indicate a late stage of the disease uh, like uh, DIC. Uh, hemoglobin could, could also be affected due to uh, hemorrhage. To diagnose uh, the disease for a patient that meets the clinical criteria and epidemiological risk factor for Ebola or Marburg virus disease, uh, it's detected in the body uh, or in the blood only after the onset of symptoms, and it uh, may keep, uh, take up uh, to three days for the virus to be detectable in a clinical sample. Therefore, if the test result is negative for sample collected less than three days of the onset of symptoms, a later specimen should be collected after 48 hours. Collect two samples with a minimum volume of four millimeters of a whole blood um, for adult and for pediatric, one ml is enough. How is Marburg virus infection treated? 
Treatment of Marburg virus is limited to supportive care, typically after hospitalization, which includes rest, hydration, oxygenation, and treatment of specific symptoms upon onset. Intravenous uh, uh, or oral fluid uh, replacement uh, could also uh, uh, be helpful to stabilize the electrolyte and maintain the blood pressure. Blood transfusion may be also provided to replace the loss uh, of blood or clotting factor in other complicated infection uh, developed, appropriate antiviral or antibiotic therapy may be indicated with co-infection. While there are not currently any approved drug treatment for Marburg virus infection, immunotherapeutic treatment known as monoclonal antibody therapy are currently under development and evaluation for treatment of uh, MVD. Antiviral therapies have been used in clinical study for Ebola that may be also tested for uh, Marburg virus disease. Regarding the vaccine, currently there are no vaccines lighting, uh, licensed to protect against uh, Marburg virus infection. Clinical trials are ongoing for a number of other vaccines candidates. In May 2020, the EMA or the European Medicines Agency has been uh, mod uh, uh, generated a marketing authorization to Zabdino and MVB uh, vaccine against Ebola virus diseases. The, uh, the MVB contains a virus which has been modified to produce four proteins from uh, for Zaire Ebola virus and three other viruses of the same group, uh, filoviridae. Uh, Phil the vaccine could, uh, could potentially protect against MVD, but its efficacy has not been proven in clinical trial yet. Marburg virus persistence in people recovering from uh, uh, the disease uh, it's known uh, to uh, persist in uh, immunoprivileged sites in some people who have recovered from uh, the disease. These sites include testicles and inside the eye. In women who have been infected while pregnant, the virus persists persist in placenta, mutic fluid, and fetus. And in women who have been infected while breastfeeding, the virus may be persist in uh, breast milk. Relapse symptomatic illness in the absence of reinfection in some who has recovered from MVD is a rare uh, event, but it has been uh, documented. Reasons for this phenomena is uh, not yet fully understood. Marburg virus transmission via infected semen has been documented uh, up after clinical recovery. Transmission by sexual contact have been documented in Ebola, and male survivors are recommended to practice safe sex for at least 12 months after clinical recovery, according to WHO, unless the semen has tested uh, uh, negative on uh, two separated occasions. More surveillance data and research are needed on uh, the risk of sexual transmission and particularly on the prevalence of a viable and transmissible virus over time. Thank you uh, for your time. And now we are going to explore more regarding infection prevention and control measures in the third heading of this webinar with my colleague, Mr. Adil al -Rizi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anadeen. Inshallah, we'll talk about the infection prevention and control measures. We'll start first with the patient placement and the isolation. We should be know that any patient is suspected or confirmed uh, cases for the Marburg virus disease, it should be under contact and droplet precaution in addition to the standard precaution. That means the patient, he should be under standard contact and droplet precaution. But we can upgrade to airborne precaution that if we have any air solo generating Procedure. That's mean if we have any air solo generation procedure, the patient he will be under airborne precaution. But we should be know what is the air solo generating procedure, or what is the definition and some examples for the uh, airborne generating uh, procedure. The, the, the definition or what is the uh, airborne generation procedure? It is any medical procedure that can be uh, release of an air solo from the respiratory tract, and this will be increase the risk of the. Uh, transmission and we have some examples for this uh, 
uh, AGP. It is like the bronchoscopy or the pulmonary resuscitation and also the manual ventilation or the tracheal intubation. This is all it is as an example for the ASO generating procedure. Next, please. Uh, for the patient placement or the patient or the suspected confirmed cases, it should be uh, uh, isolated in single room, and this room it should be designated with a toilet and hand washing facility. And we should mention that the, uh, the hand washing facility inside the uh, bathroom it is not uh, uh, allowed or it is not uh, considered a hand washing uh, facility. It should be the room, it is single room and with hand washing facility and with designated uh, toilet. And we should be uh, know that all the time we should be keep the door uh, closed. Uh, we have some questions uh, before. Do we need for put the patient inside the uh, negative pressure room? No, no need for the uh, negative pressure room or no need for an airport infection isolation room. Single room, it would be enough to will be isolate the patient inside it. Now we'll talk about the personal protective equipment. And we should be know that the healthcare worker caring for the patient, they should be uh, apply extra infection control measures to prevent the contact with the patient blood and body fluid or any contaminated surfaces or material. Uh, and also we want to mention that uh, the, the healthcare facility or there should be a dedicated team tra trained and competent in all infection prevention and control measures to dealing with the uh, rare or virus disease. That means the healthcare facility, they should be have a team. It is dedicated as we mentioned. And also if they doesn't have, they should be work to train a dedicated team uh, to they will be deal with any suspected or confirmed case for rare or virus disease. Next, Uh, sorry for this technical issue. I think my colleague Adil has a technical issue. Adil. صوت واضح الان؟ اي واضح، تفضل عادل. طيب، now we we'll talk about the personal protective equipment. What is the type of personal protective equipment we need to use it when we are dealing with the patient suspected or confirmed? We need to use the full uh, fluid resistant gown and also if we want to use the fluid resistant cover all, full face shield, 
mask or respiratory protection as we mentioned before we need to use the respiratory protection like in 95 or the paper if we have any aerosol generating procedure next please Uh, number four, the gloves, and we should be mentioned here, it should be with extended cuff. We need to use two pair of gloves, and at minimum, if there is any shortage of the uh, supply, at the minimum, we need to, they will be only the outer gloves with the extended cuff. Uh, number five, we need to use the rubber coats. Uh, we want to talk about uh, some uh, issue before uh, putting the personal protective uh, equipment. We, need, we should be know that there is some practical, we should be uh, do it during the patient uh, care, like we need or to no touching of the eye protection or the mask, and we need to keep hand away from the face, limiting touching of the surfaces and the body fluid as much as we can, no lining or against the wall, and no kneeling down or sitting in the patient room. Also, it should be never, we will be adjusted uh, our personal protective equipment during the patient care. And in case of any breach for the personal protective equipment, like there is an, uh, a needle stick injury happen, or there is a glove separated from the cell, we need to, from the healthcare worker to he will be leave the patient uh, care zone immediately. Now we'll talk about the inspection and uh, body system. We should be know that the personal protective equipment uh, donning and doffing, it should be done in front of your colleague or it should be done uh, in front of another provider. Why? Because for the uh, inspection and the confirming that you are wearing the proper uh, or you are doing the proper uh, donning and donning of the personal protective equipment and also he will help you uh, in the process as well. Also, should we know that the inspection, it is very important because you will be checked your personal protective equipment and it will be inshallah free from any defect like if there is any cut or just any hole in this personal protective equipment. Next, please. Now we will start talk about the steps of the donning and doffing of personal protective equipment which should be mentioned here it's have the donning uh, nine steps it will be start with the first one the remove personal belongings you should be remove your personal belong like watch like uh, ring and any other uh, belongs and also you should be wear the medical scrub that means the medical scrub it should be worn under the cover all or the gown if you are wearing your thobe you need to change it to the medical scrub Three, you need to put the rubber coat. After that, you need to done the cover all and you need to zip it all away up. And after that, you need, if you want uh, to put the full resistant gown instead of the cover all, but the first choice for us, it should be the cover all. If we have shortage for the cover all, you can use uh, the gown instead of the cover all. Number six, you need to put the medical mask and follow it by the face shield or by the eye protection. Seven, you need to pull the cover all hood to cover the head. After that, you need to put the first pair. And this is the reason why we are asking to we have two double of pair. You will put the first pair of these gloves and you should be sure it should be under the cuff of the cover all. And after that, you will put the second pair of gloves, which it should be long uh, selves, as we mentioned before, gloves, and you will be cover the cuff of the cover all. That's the second pair of the uh, gloves, it should be above the cover all sleeves. After we finish talking about the donning of personal protective equipment, now we will start talk about the doffing of personal protective uh, equipment. It have 10 steps, but we should be uh, uh, mentioned before it is, uh, there is here, you will see there is this infection for the gloves many times uh, it's mentioned in the steps we should be uh, disinfect the outer gloves in the finished steps and after that all the remaining steps should be 
followed by the disinfecting of the inner uh, gloves. We'll start with the first one. As we mentioned before, you need to inspect the personal protective equipment and you need to disinfect the outer gloves with approved Ministry of Health disinfectant. And the disinfectant, it should be intermediate level disinfectant. The second one, you need to remove the outer gloves and ensure you will be not uh, contaminated the surfaces of the inner gloves. And you see here, we need to disinfect the inner gloves. Three, you need to lower the hood with back rolling motion and ensure to you will not touch your face as we mentioned before. Again, here you can see we need to disinfect the inner gloves. Five, you need to tilt head back little and you need to full unzip the suite. And also again, if you see, we need to disinfect the inner gloves. Next, please. Five, you need to holding down the cover all when you are turning inside outside with touching only the inside of the cover all and you need to avoid touching the skin or the scalp to you will not contaminate your skin or the scalp. After that, you need to dispose this gown in leak proof bag and you need again to disinfect the inner gloves. Number six, when you are lining forward, you need to gently remove the face shield by gripping the slides and fully away to discard. Again, you need for disinfect the inner gloves. Seven, you need to remove your mask and you need to disinfect the uh, inner gloves. And number eight, you need to uh, remove the hood cover. And again, you need to disinfect the inner gloves. Nine, you need to remove the inner gloves and you should be uh, take a care to you will not be contaminate your hand and after that last you need to perform the hand hygiene this is the 10 steps for the doffing of personal protective equipment now we want to talk about the environmental cleaning and disinfection we should be <clears throat> know that the filoviruses can be survived in liquid or dry material for many days it's not only for just one day it's for many days it can be uh, uh, survived and we should be know that it can be inactivated by uh, many way by the gamma irradiation or sodium hydrochloride or another intermediate level disinfection. Uh, you see here there is a link you can visit this link it's for the general directorate of infection uh, prevention uh, uh, website you will found all the approved uh, disinfected by the ministry of health it should be mentioned that uh, uh, delegate environmental cleaning and disinfection and the safe handling of the potential contaminated material are very important as we know that the blood and the uh, body uh, secretion is, is a potential infectious materials. Next, please. Uh, any healthcare worker, he will be performing the environmental cleaning and disinfection, he should be wear the personal protective equipment as we mentioned before. It's not allowed for the staff or for the healthcare worker to we will do any cleaning or disinfection without wearing the personal protective equipment. Or he will be just wearing uh, gloves or only the surgical mask. No, he should be wear full PPE as we mentioned before. And so we should be know that the environmental surfaces or any objective that it is already contaminated with blood or body fluid of the uh, suspected or confirmed cases should be immediately disinfected as soon as possible. And they should be used the Ministry of Health approved disinfecting, which should be intermediate level disinfected. We have here some examples like 0.5% chlorine solution or the solution that contain 5,000 ppm available of free uh, chlorine. We should be know that there is no perfect disinfection without cleaning. There should be there is cleaning, and after that, there should be the disinfection will be done. The application of the disinfectant it should be proceeded by cleaning to prevent the uh, uh, inactivation of the disinfectant by organic matters. Also, we need to have routine cleaning for the personal protective equipment donning and doffing. It should be done at least when per day and also it should be done if we have any doffing of the grocery contaminated personal protective equipment and also as needed if the, the area uh, or the doffing uh, area it is uh, dirty or contaminated now we will talk about the waste management uh, 
all the waste from the patient is suspected of impairment, it should be placed in double leak proof bag and it should be stored in red leak proof container. Also, the staff you should be avoid opening this container for any reasons or the manipulating of this waste. It should be closed and also it should be directly transferred away, away of the uh, offside and activation area and the healthcare worker he should be where the personal protective equipment. We want to here to mention that the healthcare worker should be immediately spray or wipe the outside surfaces of the double bag waste before they will be removed from the patient room. And what they will be used, they will be used the approved Ministry of Health disinfectant. As we mentioned before, it should be intermediate level. Now we'll talk about the management of the cases. We should be know that only uh, trained and uh, competent person he is the one only response to dealing with body of person he's died from the mere board. And we should be, when we are handling this body of this person, don't uh, wash or clean this body. And also do not perform any odd spy unless it is necessary. And also do not remove any inserted medical equipment. Don't remove the IV cannula or for catheter or the endotracheal tube. Just keep it in the patient. And also if you are dealing with this uh, dead body, you need to wear full PPE as we mentioned before. All uh, the body, it should be placed in double body bag. You will put the body in the first body bag, and after that, you will wipe over the surfaces of the first body bag by using the intermediate level disinfection, as we mentioned. After that, you need to seal it, place the body bag in the second bag again, and after that, you need also to wipe over the surfaces for the second bag, and you need to seal it again. And after that, you need to label or put the label that indicated for the highly infectious materials and directly or immediately you need to move this uh, body to the nursery or to the cemetery. Specification of the uh, body bag that will be, we will be used for the dead body. We should be note that the bag, it should be have specification or special specification that it is prevent the contamination or any leaking of any infectious material from this bag. Uh, the bag, it should be uh, in purple uh, vinyl and the minimum thick, it should be 400 micro and also should be able to hold 100 to 225 kilo at last you have it have four handles uh, uh, included in the body bag and also it will be provide full containment of blood for pathogen alhamdulillah we have this body bag with this specification and it's available in all healthcare facility how we will transport the body bag to the cemetery uh, you need to wear gloves to transport the body bag to the ambulance and also this body bag it should be transferred by two or four person it's depend about the weight of the body you need also to place this body bag in the platform of the ambulance L body bag you need to deal with it gently you need to gently place it in the ambulance you need to be careful when you are dealing with this body bag and also you need to be respect don't make it very strong or very fast in this ambulance and also it's not allowed for the family members to they will be inside the ambulance cabinet and also if you finish the ambulance it need to be cleaned and disinfected next please uh, now we'll talk about the placement of the body bag into the graves should be know that manually carry it should be for the body bag by the carrier and they should be also wearing gloves slowly you will be lower the body bag into this grave and after that you need to place the body bag into the grave please uh, the gloves that you are using you should be put it in the infectious waste to you will be disposed in the correct way and after that again you need to the clean and disinfect the ambulance after use uh, uh, thank you uh, for your listening and then we'll uh, next aspect uh, it will be about the current global plans and the international and national outbreak and it will be uh, presented by Mr. Yahya Al-Nashbar.
السلام عليكم ثانك يو سو ماتش مستر عادل كرنت جلوبال جلانس ذا انترناشونال اند اولسو ذا ناشونال فور اوت بريك ريسبوند از ماي كوليك احلام جي منشن فور ذا هيستوري اوف ذيس مابينج ريجاردينغ ذا ماربورغ فايروس جاست فور ذا سيتويشن ناو اور ديتيلد فور ذا اكسبلين ذا Outbreak. Uh, WHO aims to uh, prevent Marburg outbreak by uh, maintaining uh, surveillance uh, for Marburg virus disease and supporting at-risk country uh, to develop a preparedness plan. For explain or detailed of the uh, outbreak in Equatorial uh, Guinea uh, on 7 February 23, uh, 2023, uh, the Ministry of Health uh, was reported at least eight suspected uh, of Marburg death that uh, occurred between 7 of January and 7 of February in two village. Uh, on uh, 12 of February uh, uh, 23, uh, eight blood samples uh, were uh, collected from contact and sent to the uh, uh, lab. And that lab was in uh, Senegal because there is no lab uh, available or resource in the Quitoir uh, Guinea. Uh, on uh, 13 uh, of March, uh, sample was uh, uh, also, there is uh, two sample additional uh, sent, and the result came uh, is positive. Uh, one of the uh, cases uh, sample uh, collected from uh, that in 12th uh, of February, uh, it was uh, that case was did um, uh, and at uh, uh, 10th of February in the hospital. Another test positive of Marburg on 15 March uh, 23. Uh, between uh, 18 and 20 of March, uh, three additional laboratory confirm and also there is uh, two uh, uh, cases was in two uh, province and two village uh, the case also had a demological link uh, for the seated suspected case one of the village uh, on 20 of march uh, two more laboratory confirm case was reported uh, also uh, for the situation now or last updated till uh, uh, 4th of the april the total confirmed case was 14 cases, a suspected case three, there is uh, nine cases uh, deceased, and re uh, recovered case is one case, and there is one case uh, unknown the health status, uh, there is one case. Uh, according to the uh, travel of uh, CDC, there is uh, three uh, level for uh, travel. Uh, first one is watching, uh, practice usual uh, precautions, alert, it is level two, it can practice enhance uh, precaution, and level three is wearing, uh, avoiding uh, non-essential travel. They put uh, equity, Guinea, and the level two. Uh, regarding the uh, Tanzania, uh, according the uh, Ministry of the Health of United Republic of Tanzania announced in 16 of March, uh, there is uh, seven cases and five deaths from unknown uh, disease has been uh, reported into a village. Uh, and officially in 21 of March, uh, Ministry of Health, they uh, announced there is outbreak of Mirbor. And this first case, uh, this is first outbreak in the country. Uh, as uh, last updated in 22 of, uh, of March, the total confirmed case was uh, eight cases. Under treatment, there is th uh, three cases. And there is monitoring or under tracing 161. And there is five cases. As uh, death, Marburg, uh, they put, according to the CDC of the travel uh, health, uh, they put in the level one. Uh, according to the uh, WHO response, uh, Marburg uh, virus epidemic preparedness alert uh, control and uh, evaluation, when an, an outbreak uh, detected uh, uh, WHO response by supporting surveillance community engagement case, management, laboratory service, contact tracing, infection control, logistic support, and uh, training and assess with safe uh, plural uh, practice. Uh, WHO has a uh, uh, detailed advice on Marburg infection prevention control, as uh, my colleague Mr. Adel uh, mentioned uh, of that, and also for the HO, uh, WHO risk assessment, uh, they but that one, uh, Equatorial Guinea, facing an outbreak in the first time, 
and the country capacity manage uh, they try to manage the outbreak and need to assessment and need assess from WHO there is uh, three uh, if effect that uh, uh, international uh, border uh, with Cameroon and Gabon and cross uh, border population of uh, movement are uh, frequent uh, there is no uh, Marburg uh, cases have been reported outside equatorial Guinea uh, the risk international spread uh, cannot be rolled out the risk assessment is currently uh, be uh, reviewed however is the consider now very high in the uh, national level and high at the sub regional level and moderate at the regional level and low in the global level for the public health uh, response in depth epidemiological investigation underway to uh, determine the source of the outbreak national teams have been uh, deployed in the affect uh, district uh, for if for active case finding contact tracing isolating and providing the medical care to case uh, WHO has uh, deployed expert in the epidemiological case uh, epidemiological uh, in the epidemiology and also for the case uh, management infection uh, prevention uh, control and laboratory and risk communication to support national response uh, effort and ensure community engagement WHO also uh, facilitated the achievement uh, of tent material sample collection and analysis and ferial uh, hemorrhagic fever kit including personal protective equipment for uh, 500 uh, healthcare worker uh, WHO also supporting the uh, transportation sampling and laboratory to Senegal and Gabon as plan are they underway to set up laboratory facility in the country <clears throat> According to the national level, um, uh, IHR in the Ministry of Health gives the instruction to the healthcare worker working in the entry uh, point detected the case from the first uh, point. And uh, on 31 of March, public health authority that Wakaya has been issued a warning to travel to Equatorial Guinea and Tanzania. Also, there is uh, the GCC uh, government also the same. <clears throat> Warning to travel to Aquaria, Guinea, and Tanzania, and some of uh, that one GCC uh, they provide or they uh, recommend to the uh, travel arrival from this country to uh, isolate themselves. Uh, also, that should be uh, IPC measurement uh, implemented. Uh, trained healthcare worker. Uh, one case they uh, dealing or suspect uh, dealing with the suspect case. Also, the increase the awareness. There is no issue for this situation now. But during that one, al uh, Hajj season or al uh, season. Uh, now finish and thank you so much. Uh, now, I'll, uh, 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 my mic to uh, my colleague Ahlam. Uh, thank you so much, Yahya, for your informative part. Um, well, uh, so at the end, uh, remember that uh, as a kingdom, Saudi Arabia, alhamdulillah, uh, was and still is the one of the leading countries that consider as a reference and role model in dealing with an emerging and re-emerging diseases. And our experience in the COVID-19 is an example of the ability of our country to confine any outbreak by these emerging or re-emerging uh, microorganism, uh, by our um, support from our higher authority, and also by our competent and dedicated healthcare workers who are considered heroes in the front line of the healthcare facilities. So finally, we finish our today's webinar. Thank you so much uh, for your supporting us by attending uh, this webinar and kul aam wa antum khair. And if you have any question, do not hesitate to contact us through our um, email at gdibc.mo.government.sa. And this is the barcode and also the website for any further resources that required to improve our, um, or if you have um, further um, uh, obtaining any further information or resources regarding our topic for today. Thank you so much and have a lovely inshallah iftar.